Frank, we are live on Twitter and Facebook because YouTube banned us for doing an Amazon Prime ad read. Anyways, how did you enjoy uh, your time on Amazon Prime last week? <laughs> you you think that's why they banned you. You're not entirely sure. So we'll, we'll see. Um, <laughs> it was great. Look, Coast to Coast, I think, has tons of room for growth. Uh, love seeing the quad box. And I'm looking forward to that being some appointment television for fans um on thursday nights to get there and and whip around the league i i i don't buy for one second the fact that people say hey hockey's not like football you can't do a red zone style show like huh there's tons of things that happens in football games that don't come from the red zone interceptions pick six uh field goals uh whatever long td passes runs whatever it might be so you you get to that in a second when the action happens. And in the meantime, I don't know, you could certainly do uh, power plays could be their version of a red zone. So I see tons of room for growth and looking forward to uh, to being a small part of it. And that said, I think you guys got the moment of the game wrong last night. Ooh, what do you think oh, the moment it? of the game was? Leon Dreisaitl sitting on the bench for two rotations. Yeah, we did chat about that. So yeah, we talked I know about you talked about it, but that's the moment of the game okay why i mean i'm intrigued to know what angle you're coming at this from because i think this is really the first time that i can remember in this generation this iteration of oilers hockey that someone has said to the star players hey that's not good enough you're gonna need to take a seat am i, I wrong I, I was no. hoping that's the way you were going to come at it because, listen, we did this whole thing with Dryzetta last year when they were struggling and he was doing a lot of this same stuff, taking dumb, undisciplined penalties. It's something he tends to do, and I like Chris Knobloch. Listen, I don't think he does that if the Oilers are 3-0 and to start the year, and that's just a one-off game against Philly, but that was him putting his foot down, and I honest, I have a lot of respect for that. But it was not, it was not um, over the top. Like it wasn't like, hey, you're sitting for a whole period because at that point you're just damaging your team's chances to win. But it was a subtle message that, you know, if you weren't even really paying attention that closely, you you might have missed it. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, a crazy big demonstration um, of power or a flex or anything like that. It was just a simple message to say, you are part of this team. You're being held to the same standard that I would hold anyone else to. And the fact that this has this start has been as sloppy as it's as it's been and disorganized at times that I, we got to do something about this, that a message needs to be sent. And, and that's why I think it was really important. So if they would have like big win last night, and it feels like especially in the third, they got their swagger back a little bit. They're zipping the puck around and then the OT winner was electric, all of that stuff. If it wouldn't have gone their way, 0-4, it would have been, I think, full-on freak-out mode amongst Oilers fans and amongst nation citizens. Is I, I'm curious for the outsider view. Were we overreacting at 0-3? Would we have been overreacting at 0-4? Like, you would think we went through this last year, so it shouldn't be that way, but it, it was. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone was because how, like, there's no chance... Like had had okay, let me back up for a second. Had the Oilers been 0 and 3 or 0 and 4 and 97 29 and their offense was absolutely on fire and they were losing games in different ways, I would say, yeah, okay, like there might be some reason to be concerned here because maybe this defense is really showing some warts, or maybe, you know, and look, Stuart Skinner has been inconsistent, and I thought. Matt Larkin had a great story yesterday on Daily Faceoff about look at his save percentage month to month and look at how it, it really comes down to individual save percentages that have tanked varying parts of, of these seasons. And, and by the way, the stretch where the Oilers win 16 in a row, he, no surprise to anyone, leads the entire league in save percentage in that stretch. So some of it is all is all correlated. My point is... When you look at this team, there was zero chance that those guys were going to go on for any sustained period of time without finding a way to contribute. And so because that's what was really the biggest missing ingredient, I wasn't concerned and didn't really have a big reason to be concerned moving forward. I, I think too, I think you're right, Frank, like 
they also had a ton of goals disallowed. They've hit the post so many times, which the goals disallowed thing. I'm not going to ask you to explain goalie interference because, quite frankly, I don't think you have the answer because I'm not sure anyone does. But do you think after what has happened, and obviously we're kind of in the thick of it, do you think the inconsistency of goalie interference is going to force NHL head coaches now to be like, well, maybe it is, so I'm going to challenge it? Like, just not knowing. Like Throw more night, darts. Yeah, throw more darts at the ball. Like, last night, Knobloch said, he's like, well, there was something similar that happened in Vancouver, so I assume this was kind of the same. Well, I, I think the thing that dissuades you from throwing more darts is the minor penalty. And yeah. you just had the graphic on the screen with the Oilers' penalty kill percentage so far this season. Sources say not good. <laughs> um it it has struggled, which has been maybe also one of the biggest surprises this year because of how well they they were, how how successful they were at killing penalties in the postseason. 64 out of 70, I think, was the number. I mean, that's a crazy turnaround to be dead last in the in the league in PK to start. Again, not sure that I saw that coming, even with some of the changes in personnel. So uh, will they throw more darts? I doubt it because the last thing you want to do is compound the issue that you have. And yeah, I, I think you're right. Like, what if just one of those goals stayed on the board against the Flames? You're up 2 nothing. All of a sudden, you can approach it a different way. And the game probably has a bit of a different result. Instead... It was not just one giant pendulum swinging of momentum. It was two. And then all of a sudden Calgary gets on the board and things kind of, you know, change in a hurry. So that's kind of the way last night felt, right? It was like snowballing a bit in that first 10 minutes. And it was like, okay, not only does the Mitch Koff goal count, but they're going on the power play. And then like, it's just, it, it just kind of continued to, to work against them. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know, man. I, I'm so confused by it, but I'll, I'll add that what we're going through right now as a fan base in terms of being frustrated, it feels like at varying points over the last three years, every fan base has gone through this. Is it? Is there a path to them simplifying and solving the goalie interference issue, or is it just one of those rules that is fickle by nature and a gray area by nature? I don't think there is a way to, to totally fix it. I think they tried to be more consistent by taking the decision out of the officials hands on the ice and placing all of that in the hands of the situation room in Toronto. You think instead of dealing with 50 referees or however many there are, we've got six guys that work in a, in the situation room on a night to night basis. And because those guys are going to see everything that therefore They'll, they'll be more consistent in their decision-making. They've tried that part already. And I, I think, to me, the two that we saw over the weekend, and it wasn't just the Perry one, but it was also the Rempy one in New York, screening the goalie, has like, taking his eyes away, has been like the name of the game forever. I don't understand how we've arrived at this point where just being in front of him suddenly is too much. And I think there probably needs to be an adjustment on that front, but I don't, I don't know how they get there. Meaning it seems like it's, it's flopped so far the other way toward protecting the goalie that we've, we've just gotten away from like, Hey, sometimes things are going to be a battle in front of you. Sometimes when you get poked 11 seconds before the puck actually gets to the net, like you've had your chance to reset and make the save that it, it's almost become such a put these goalies in bubble wrap that I just don't think makes sense for the game. And I don't think it makes sense for, you know, the path that the NHL wants to head down mm -hmm. or should want to head down. What should be more offense. What did you think of Mitch Kov? I think he's the real deal. Um, I, the Flyers love the way that he competes, and you guys saw it last night. Tyler was saying um, on today's Daily Faceoff Live that you know he felt like every time he turned around, there was Mitchkoff in a battle for a puck. And that part is huge, even for a guy that's a little bit undersized. He skates really well. He's deceptive. Uh, that goal that he scored on the goal line, 
you're probably going to see 10 more of those this season. That's like, he does that a lot. And there's a lot of pressure facing him because being in this market and living here, first off, fans are really antsy and they want to see their team get better. And second, even like the most casual, like they might watch two games a year, hockey fans here. Everyone knows who this guy is and everyone wants to know more about him. Anytime I see someone, Hey, is this guy the real deal? Is he, you know, can he actually put this team back on the map? I think the answer to that is yes. The Flyers have been really cautious in terms of expectations and wanting to try and tamp those down. He's a 19 year old kid, but I think even he's exceeded their own expectations from training camp and the start of this season, because he's, he's answered the bell every time. Yeah. He looked, he looked really good last night. Obviously those two goals were big. His back check in overtime was, awesome. I'm sure John Tortorella is, <laughs> was just fuming at that one because he just totally turns and starts heading back up ice and dries. that just floats perfectly in the slot. It was, it was, uh, it was wild to watch. Uh, last area I wanted to touch on with you was uh, the Johnny Goudreau tribute in Columbus last night. We obviously dissected it, and that's a, probably a poor choice of words on this. But, like, we, we talked about it on DFO Live, is my point. Equal parts touching and heartbreaking. Yeah, I, I thought it was so beautifully done. Um, I can't, like, I, I'm amazed at, and I marveled at so many different parts of it. The strength of, of everyone involved. Um, the message from Johnny Gaudreau's wife, Meredith, before the game, I don't want you to be sad. Uh, you know, John loved hockey and and he would want you to enjoy this. Um, that part I think really resonated. Um, just to stand there in front of 19,000 people and continue your grieving process. I mean, this is still fresh. This is six weeks ago. And to see Sean Monahan and these two guys that were so close in Calgary um, be reunited and him holding little Johnny here. Like it just, it doesn't, it still doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute, but I thought, you know, in terms of everyone trying to wrap their arms around this and in some ways also wrap their arms around each other. Um, I thought this was so well done and such a nice touch to, you know, to start the game the way that they did, it, it was perfect. His family there, Guy Gaudreau on the ice at practice and morning skate. It just, the the Florida Panthers uh, participation in this, Sam Bennett and Matthew Kachuk, former teammates, the Skittles, the Purple Gatorade, like every part of it was so perfect. And I think that's what's also so awful is it's such a horrible situation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, again, Columbus did speechless. a good job with it, and then you know Monahan goes and scores too, and has yeah. the point up. It was an emotional night uh, in Columbus. Frank, appreciate you hopping on once again this week. Thanks for doing this. We'll chat uh, next week. See you guys. See you, Frank. What's up, Nation citizens? If you like that video, then you need to be subscribed to the Oilers Nation YouTube podcast, live shows, exclusive interviews and analysis, everything you need from your favorite voices at Oilers Nation. And you don't want to miss any of it, so hammer that subscribe button.